Hey, I want to say welcome to Ashland Grace. I'm so glad you're here to be a part of, of the worship service. If you're in the, if, welcome to those in the Cove. Maybe you're watching on the AU Network, the, you know, the Ashland deal. Or maybe you're in the Junction or the, uh, the cafe. Welcome. So glad that you're here at Ashland Grace today. So today we're going to take a look at John chapter 4. It's in the New Testament. If you turn there, we're going to get right to work here in just a second on John chapter 4. Now don't panic. I did put John 4, 1 to 145. Believe me, we will be out by 4.30, so it's not going to take, it's not going to take that long. So just, you don't need to cancel any of your lunch plans. So uh, John chapter 4. And, uh, you know, uh, Jesus, we're going we're gonna, to, let me give you a Reader's Digest version of what's kind of cooking as we lead up to this. So Jesus has been uh, making disciples and John's been baptizing, and the Pharisees are really not in typical fashion, really thrilled with Jesus. And so they're not been super welcoming. And in the beginning of John, John 1 and 2, it says that, uh, now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. So this is where we're going to pick up. And just so you know, um, back, the, the, where he's going to go through Samaria. And bottom line is, um, there's, a, there's a quick way to get to to Galilee, and the disciples aren't really wild about going around. And so, just so you know, the, the uh, like I said, the brief history on the Samaritans is back in 721 BC, before, before Christ, the Assyrian army came in and took most of the Jews out in exile, took them out. Uh, not out like killed them, but out as physically out of the, of the place. So they left a few in the land uh, that began to intermarry with the Assyrians, that came, with, that came in and took over the land. And so the people were left with the Samaritans, and now they're considered half-breeds, okay? So the Jews really do not want to hang out at all. They really think of them like cattle. They just really don't care for them, period. So the disciples and Jesus are going to, they've talked about maybe going a, the long way around. I'm going to show you a quick map. It's maybe harder to see, but I'll give you some illustrations that hopefully make it sticky to you. But they're willing to go three to six days journey east to go around uh, to get up to Galilee instead of going straight through Samaria. It's a straight shot. So imagine our GPSs, you know, it says, hey, do you want to avoid tolls, bridges, Sumerians, okay? So you get the idea. They don't want, good, you're with me. You guys have had some caffeine. Uh, so they do not want to go through Samaria, period. Uh, they consider them unclean, and really any devout Jew uh, wouldn't even walk near Samaria, okay? They didn't even want the soil of their sandals to touch. I mean, that's how despised they can't stand them. And so, like I said, they would go three to six days journey around, so they would not have to even go through there. And so um, they went through, you know, they went to Jordan. They basically had to cross the Jordan River on the right-hand side, kind of the east. And so um, we just read about the Pharisees are not really welcoming to Jesus. Isn't that typical? Sometimes the church people aren't that welcoming, and we're going to read more about who's welcoming in this. And so, uh, by the way, just so you get the idea about uh, trying to avoid Galilee, or excuse me, avoid Samaria, think of it as if you want to get to Ashland to Cleveland, right? That's pretty simple, straight ahead. And if you want to, maybe you really want to avoid Medina, okay? You can get on Google Maps and look this up. Trust me on this. But let's say you do not want to go through Galilee. You, want, you don't want to go through Medina, so you go through Youngstown, Okay, yeah, you guys have been out of town, haven't you? They got some great restaurants there. So Youngstown, they're gonna go through Youngstown to get to Cleveland to go up to see LeBron back. So they, they wanna avoid Medina. So imagine this, say you're leaving Ashland Grace today and you're pulling out and you wanna go, I don't know, to Home Depot or the mill or I think you all maybe wanna avoid Walmart, but, you, but instead of going to Walmart through town, through Ashland downtown, you wanna avoid downtown, you go to Hayesville. Okay, so you, yeah, the Hayesville group. So you, it's almost like you're getting on 71, so it makes no sense to go that way. So that's how much they, they, the Jews really did not care for uh, the, the Samaritans. So if you were a Jewish person, a Jewish man would never, ever speak to a woman in public, okay? Even if it was his family. He was very careful if he did, how he communicated with her. Now, if you were a Jewish rabbi, he would never speak to a woman publicly, ever, period, okay? End of discussion. But we're going to see in a minute that Jesus breaks through all these barriers here as he starts the conversation. And by the way, Jesus always starts the conversation. And let's pick up in, uh, so John 4, um, John 4, and I just read 1 and 2, but let's pick up on, on 3. So it says, he, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee, and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar. 
near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Joseph's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So sixth hour back then would have been high noon, okay? So it's the hottest point of the day. We're seeing Jesus' humanity. Here's God. Uh, here's Jesus, fully God and fully man. He's weary. He's worn out. And by the way, the disciples took off. They went to get lunch. They went to get Subway, Taco Bell, Chick-fil-A, something probably to go to bring back. So the disciples are gone, and it's Jesus at the well. And this well had been around like 2,000 years. It's a big-time well. And so um, Jesus says to her, uh, would you give me... Okay, so a woman from Samaria um, came out, I'm in verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, a woman of Samaria? For Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. And so basically there's three strikes going on. Number one, She's thinking, okay, you're talking to me, I'm a woman, and you're a man. That's strike one. Strike two is, I'm a Samaritan, and you're a Jew. That's strike two. And strike three, if you knew what I've been up to, if you knew the kind of life I've been living, kind of what I've been up to, you would would not, we would not want to have anything to do with me. And by the way, the time of the day that we see when Jesus meets the woman at the well is high noon. And typically back, back then, uh, the time to get water was usually in the mornings, okay? The ladies would go out to get the water, kind of chat it up, kind of gal's time, you know what I'm saying? At the, talk, at the, talk at the sister and talk at the well. Or you'd go late at night, later in the evening, in the cool of the evening. And so we don't know why did the, why'd the gal go out at noon, probably to get some more, but my guess is she probably wanted to avoid the sneers, the sideway comments, the kind of the housewives of Samaritan, Samaritan type deal that, you know what, I want to avoid these comments and these looks. I probably would too. It's a small price to pay for maybe the, 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 the conviction of the way she's feeling about her life. Basically, all her girlfriends have probably unfriended her on Facebook. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So this is, things have not been going well for her. So there's no even reason that Jesus should even be talking to her. So, um... Anyway, so she's in there in the middle of the day. She's trying to avoid all the women. And um, we're about to find out the life that she's been living through the conversation with Jesus. But you know what the Bible just said in verse 4? And I love this. He had to pass through Samaria. We, we just looked at a map. No, he didn't have to pass through Samaria, did he? He didn't have to go through there. I mean, here's a guy that created the heavens and the earth. He mapped this place out. He did not have to go through Samaria, but he did. You know why? Because it's not a really geographical reason, it's a theological reason. He came because there was some woman at the well that no one, was like, no one else was willing to reach out to. Someone that had, has been avoiding the community, avoiding the pain, and the, the, you know, we're going to learn more about her life. So Jesus knows about this woman and says, we're going there, okay? And because you know why? Here's the good news. Jesus came for everybody, he didn't come for us church people or people that are uh, in mops or want or go to Sunday school. It, he came for everybody in our entire community and in our, in our nation. And so here's the point one is he even came for the least of these. So Jesus goes where no one else will go. And in your, and in your folders, your, your pamphlets, we've got these notes written out. If you want to write goes and uh, goes will go. So here's the thing is Jesus not only broke the social rules, he broke religious gender, racial barriers, everything kind of goes out the window when we're, when we're working with Jesus. He crossed them all and blasts through them because Jesus is for everyone. He's going to go where no one else is willing to go. He had to because there was a woman there that was going to be waiting for him. So let me ask you, I wonder, I wonder who's waiting on you. I wonder who's waiting on you at school. Those boys and girls or maybe students that are in here, the, the ones that eat alone, the ones that seem to have no friends, the ones that maybe are starting to get bullied or picked on, I wonder if they're waiting for you to just start the conversation about God. I wonder in your neighborhood who's waiting on you. I have some new neighbors that I think are waiting on me. I've already caught some of the discussion early on. It's kind of an inside deal, but uh, I've had kind of multiple neighbors recently in the last year, which... I got that going for me. I wonder who's waiting for you at your workplace, at the place you work. I work with all Christians. So there's not a lot waiting on me here at Ashland Grace. But in the circles you, you, you see, I wonder who's waiting on you. I wonder 
Who's waiting on you in the restaurants you eat at or that hostess, the server, the maitre d', the person that you see all the time? I wonder if they're waiting on you to start the discussion about God. You know, Jesus seems so important to us that, you know, we're here at church, we're not at home mowing, we're not outside, we're not out playing golf, we're, we're, we're worshiping, we're talking about Jesus. And so I wonder what message we're sending to the unbelieving world. I mean, they don't drive by Ash and Grace and wonder, hey, is that a mall? Right? They, yeah, they don't do that. They know it's a church. It says grace on the building. And I'm hoping that we live grace-filled lives. So Jesus goes where no one else will go. Because we're followers of Christ, there are going to be places we need to go that others aren't willing to go. And there's also going to be conversations we need to have that people, other believers, other people may not be willing to have. But we need to, because of our love, we're compelled by Christ. So Jesus goes where no one else will go. Um, so let me go, can I, let me go back to verse 7. It says, a woman from Samaria came to draw, that's right, I read this, but let's do it again. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away in the city for food. A Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews had no dealing with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying it to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given it given you living water. So she's asking basically, how is it that you, a Jewish man, is asking me for a drink, okay? And the request is basically saying, I'm expecting you, can I get a drink? And she's probably thinking, why are you even associating with me? And Jesus replies, if you only knew, if you could only comprehend the gift that God has for you, if you only knew the forgiveness God has for you. If you only knew that you didn't have to clean up your life to come to me, you'd be saved. And that's amazing. And she responds back, sir, you don't have anything to draw water with. I mean, she was thinking he was talking about H2O, like regular water, and he's talking about living water. Verse 13 says, Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Not only does Jesus go where no one else will go, this is really good news, Jesus gives what no one else can give. Jesus gives what no one else can give. Not your jobs, not your careers, not your children, not where you live, not your zip code, not your vacations, not your 401k, your Roth IRA, whatever. It's only Jesus can give you that, the living water. You know, later in in John chapter 7, John 38, he says, Let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. He who believes in me, rivers of living water will flow from within him. That's awesome. And he's referencing the Holy Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit will, will give us the power. And, you know, when, we, when Dan talked earlier about Acts 1-8, about Jesus ascending into heaven, he's leaving us with the Holy Spirit. So we have somebody to help us with those conversations. And you say, mate, well, hey, I may not be ready to, to share my faith or talk about Jesus. You know what? The Holy Spirit's ready. You just need to start the conversation. Well, I hear people say, well, I just don't want to push him away. Push him away to what? Hell number two? Hell number three? Hell number four? You get the idea. It, it's got to be about Jesus and seeing the eyes. So he's talking about the living water, and she's talking about the well. And by the way, just for references, the spring is a water table that reaches the earth's surface. So it's water that's coming up and reaches the, water, the, the earth's surface. A well is man-made, okay? Man makes it, and we, we learned Jacob, uh, Jacob's well, it was deeper than the water table. So it's going down, and they can draw from it. And eventually, wells are going to what? Run dry, okay? I know we're all in city water here, but there's people that have wells, and you got to take care of them. And John 10, 10, 10 says, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Okay, and he's the only one that can give it to you. Jesus gives what no one else can give, and all he's going to give it to you, but he's going to give it to you abundantly. You know, a funny example that I think of, um, of more than enough, is when, I, when it's time, I have a wife, lovely wife, and two little daughters, so I'm out, man, three to one. And usually when it's time to go on vacation, you know, if we're going to be gone five days, I think, okay, I need to be, bring some golf shirts, golf pants, socks, you know, shorts, you get the idea, five days. 
But the girls in my house, they want, they want options, okay? They're not sure five outfits is going to be enough. What if I want to wear pink? What if I want to accessorize? What about my bow? What about my shoes? What about this? What about that? And I'm thinking, hey, it's just a five-day deal. And next thing you know, what are we packing for a month? You know, jamming it in there. I thought, hey, we're just going for five days to, to Indiana or Michigan or whatever. And next thing you know, we got three suitcases out. And one of them's mine. And you know, you know, you pack in so much when it's overflowing. This John 10, 10 about Jesus overflowing. You know, when you're trying to get it, you're sitting on the bed trying to sit on it and the, pull the zipper and it's just crying out and you're praying it doesn't break. It's overflowing. That's the kind of overflowing that Jesus is talking about, that you're going to have more than enough, more than enough clothes, more than enough as, and, and that Jesus is going to provide. And uh, like we said, verse 14 says, um, and let me read verse 14. So whatever, whoever drinks this water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. So she's thinking everything that she's been looking for could be answered in this man. Here's a man that doesn't want anything from her, but is, she's probably sensing this guy is from God. And the thirst that we've all been trying to quench, if you're outside of Jesus, it'll never fill you. It's almost like drinking salt water. It's going to make you thirstier and want more and more, bigger and better, newer. And it just, it just does not stop. And it's, it's hard, I think, in our culture, the way we look at TV, the media, it makes us want to be discontent. But we need to be content in what Jesus has to offer as living water. So it's really a story of a, as a woman meeting a man at a well, and she's probably met a lot of men at this well. We don't know that, but she probably has. And the village already knows about the life she's lived, okay? She's been through five husbands, uh, as we're going to learn, and so um, she's got quite a, quite a history with them. So for the first time, she's met someone who was offering something of value that's going to that's gonna outlive her, and she wasn't asking for anything in return. He, he, this is a guy that's different. And l- let me jump to verse 16. And this, this conversation that, that Jesus is about to have is going to change the entire trajectory of this entire conversation. Jesus said to her, verse 16, go call your husband and come here. The Samaritan woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband, for you've had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. And so the problem isn't that she, hadn't, she didn't have a husband. The problem is um, She's had, you know, she's had five. There's been a lot of, you know, that's a lot of marriages in any generation, right? And Jesus is looking for her honesty and not playing this game. Yeah, well, yeah, well, whatever. I need to go now. But she actually answered Jesus, which is awesome. And, you know, I would probably be, if I was saying that to Jesus, I'd be wondering, I wonder what kind of response I'm going to get. Here goes that deal of the living water out the door that I knew he was going to go there. And now this is, there's going to be a catch. And Jesus, you know, in the, only the way he can there was no criticism, no anger, no what kind of a mess have you made of your life type deal. It wasn't perfection that Jesus was after. It was her honesty. And, you know, what I love about this passage is that Jesus confronts her, her, her sin, but not in a spirit of judgment. Okay? Because I've, all, I've heard a uh, leader recently say that all truth and no love is brutality. It's just brutal. If if you're all truth and you're not loving people, it's brutal. But then if you love people and there's just no truth... You're just playing games. You're, you're fooling. You're not helping anything. So he's not lecturing. He's not saying, boy, I am really glad I missed out on lunch with the guys because you are one messed up lady, okay? So this is, here's an outcast. Jesus is basically talking to the outcast of outcasts. And um, you probably know the rest of the story. And I, I really wish you didn't because I think to hear, to, to learn for the first time how Jesus responded and imagine her eyes being wide-eyed as Jesus is about to tell her how she can have this living water and forgiveness. And maybe you've wanted to do the same thing, you know? Maybe you've wanted to take off your mask and say, well, God, this is, this is where it hurts. This is what's really been going on. Or maybe you've wanted to stop pretending. Or you're maybe reluctant to open the, you know, the cob-covered door of secret sin. But you know what? God's, God's going to confront it and he's going to deal with it. And he, and he loves you enough to do it because he doesn't want you to live in those chains, and those bondage. Many people think, well, if I could just have that one drink, that one smoke, that one job, that one wife, that one husband, that one house, that one car, that one whatever, it's not going to satisfy, period, ever. And, we, and it's easy to think it will. Yeah, well, just maybe if I get a 2015. No, it's, it's only Jesus. 
So this woman is now wondering what's Jesus going to do now that he said, hey, go get your husband. Is he going to be angry? Is he going to leave? Is he going to tell me I'm worthless? I mean, I've just heard that five times from five other men. What's going to make him different? If you've had the same anxieties and wondering, oh, man, how's, how's Jesus going to respond to this? Uh, there's good news, and you're going to want to underline this. Um, he beautiful, beautifully communicates this to the lady because she knows he's from God. And... Um, let me, let me pick it up in verse 18. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. This woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped him, worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. I, thought this, I always thought this was a ploy, kind of a distracting ploy, like, yeah, Jesus, well, let's talk about worship at churches, you know, brands, denominations, but I really believe she, she knew that this guy was the real deal, was Jesus. And so he wanted to talk, she wanted to talk about worship things, and Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you, now, what you do not know. We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews, but the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. That's her. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. He who is called the Christ. So she's looking for him. This has not disqualified her, right, from the life she's been living. She actually knew that, this, that the Messiah is coming. And this is beautiful. I know the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And this is easy to overlook. Jesus said to her, I am. I who speak to you am he. I speak to you, am he. Translation, I'm the Messiah. Isn't that amazing? The outcast of outcasts, the marginalized, the forgotten about, he's revealing that I'm the, Jesus is the Messiah to her. You know what? It's interesting is he, he didn't decide, you know what? I'm going to set up an appointment on Pinterest with, uh, I guess you wouldn't do Pinterest with King Herod, but to set up an appointment with Herod and say, hey, by the way, I'm Jesus, just so you know, we get that straight. He didn't go to the Sanhedrin. He didn't go to the Roman court. He said, I'm the Messiah. Imagine this. He's not supposed to be talking to women, let alone Samaritan women. So he's talking basically to a nobody in, in the world's terms. But in Jesus' eyes, this is the person that I need to be talking to. And by the way, the, the disciples were just there in, in in Samaria, okay? Aren't they a little more qualified to be talking about Jesus, right? Yeah, I would think they'd be, but no, Jesus uses them. So maybe you've got friends that maybe on the outside, they're not saying, hey, where's God? Where should I worship? But maybe the way they're, they're acting, the way they spend money, they spend time, the way they parent, the way they do life is, is saying to you they're looking for they're, they're drinking from a, drinking from a well that's just not going to give them give them life. But you can see the life chasing after that's just not worth it. So the disciples show back up, uh, and so verse twenty seven. Just then the disciples came back. Whoa, they're back. They marveled at what he was talking with the woman, but no one said, "What do you seek?" or "Why are you talking with her?" So the woman left her water jar and went into the town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of town and were coming to him. Isn't that amazing? So here's, the, here's something else encouraging. She leaves her water there. Isn't that like the disciples when they learned about Jesus said, hey, come follow me, leave your nets, leave your tax collecting and follow me. She left her burdens at Jesus' feet in Samaria on a noon hot day. That's awesome. Jesus bought the moment, okay? Not only did he go straight, he went straight up and said, we're not going to go around. We're going to go straight there. He maximized his moment with, with this woman at the well. And you've heard the adage that God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Well, he just equipped the called with this lady. And, it cha- and it's going to transform an entire community because of her. Imagine that. You know what? Some of you, when you say, I, I want to seize the moment, you don't know you know everything about the Bible or be a Christian for 24 years and have an autographed copy of the ESV or have written Purpose Driven Life. You just need to say, hey, look, I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. That's, that's pretty simple. So Jesus, the, the disciples come back, 
And Jesus does what only Jesus can do is he takes a drifting life and give it direction. And if we're going to do that, we have got to have open eyes, okay? And here, let me give you some illustrations from, from the nature that I think will help draw that point of giving eyes. This is an eagle. And I, I really wish uh, my friend Tom Castor and I saw more of these on the golf course. A um, few golfers in the audience. Yeah, so eagles and, and Dan when we're playing. Yeah, Chris, you know what I'm talking about. Some more eagles. Less five putts. So the eagle, uh, believe it or not, you're going to love this. He has the sharpest eye of all the birds of prey. The eagle has three to four times sharper eyes than we do, and they can spot rabbits from several miles away. So if you've got little dogs at home, you may want to be checking for eagles. Now, hawks and buzzards uh, often scan the earth from a height of 10 to 15,000 feet. Okay, that's, that's like nosebleed level. And not only that, but they can swoop in at 100 miles an hour and grab their prey. That's the kind of vision God's given them. There's another one. I thought this was a cute, cute image. It's an owl. Yeah. Oh. And it's, they have eyes almost as big as ours, okay? And their, their, ca- their, um, their pupils capture lots of light. And they can actually spot a mouse in a football stadium down at the shoe, let's say with the lights out, with just one candle of light. They can see that and, and, and get it. So their brains, the way that God's wired the owl, is they can capture in one glance, you know, like we're doing a panoramic on your iPhone, they can zoom in and get everything in one glance with their heads. Amazing. And the human eye would have to go back and forth. I wonder what kind of eyes to have like that. And since their forward-facing eyes are so big, you know, they can't move them, okay? It's like they hurt their neck. But like eagles, they can actually swivel their heads 270 degrees. So imagine making a bobblehead... You know, they kind of did that. Okay, anyway, the sharks. Let's go to the next one. I didn't practice that one. The sharks have underwater vision, okay? And they can detect a glow that's 10 times dimmer than anything we're capable of seeing, okay? Not only that, but God's given them special cells in their brains that detect electrical fields. And those electrical fields, they can pick up on the nearest twitch of a muscle and attack. So next time you're watching the shark show, imagine how God's given them some vision. The next one is the snake. Not a real pretty one, but they have, God's given them thermal vision, okay? We're all talking about eyes to see. The snake has thermal vision, which has temperature-sensitive organs uh, located between the eyes and nostril. And so pythons, boas, pit, uh, boa constrictors, pit vipers, allow these snakes to sense body heat of their prey. And they can perceive, perceive depth and strike even in complete darkness, okay? So you're going to want your lights on, you know what I'm saying? But I think they go south when it gets around 40 degrees, <laughs> And the last one, uh, the horse. Uh, the all the best all around view is the grazing mammals, Mr. Ed. And I've always told my friends, if you want a stable relationship, just date a horse. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, date a horse. So horses, gazelles, zebras, mammals. Uh, if they had forward-facing eyes like we have, that would cost them. That could hurt them in the wild because they wouldn't be able to see, you know, predators on the side. So God put them on the side of their head, and. It's all, they can almost have a, uh, an all-round view on the sides of their head. So here's the deal. Our eyes have got to be wide open. And my prayer for you is that when you see people in our community, wherever you are, that you have eyes to see the, the lost, the marginalized, people that just are waiting to have that conversation. Maximize the moment. Jesus maximized it when he went and talked to the woman at the well. You can, you can too, maximize it in your um, frame of life. We just said that Jesus uh, talked to the woman. She said, hey, uh, you know, when Jesus said, I'm the Messiah, she left her water and took off. And here's what you need to know. A changed life can change a life. Isn't that awesome? A changed life, your changed life can change someone else's life in Ashland. Your changed life can change someone's life at your workplace, at your school. But you say, wait, man, I, I can't do that. I'm, I, boy, God, why am I at the job I'm at? All these, I'm surrounded by these pagans. That's right. Jesus came to save the lost. I mean, why else did Jesus leave us on earth, right, than to be making disciples? And you can do that by looking to, because your life story, your story can change a life. Maximize your moment. And you know what? God can use all your hang-ups, your hiccups, your reversals. He can use all that for his glory. And we talked about earlier uh, in Acts 1.18. When Jesus was ascending into heaven, let me read that. He says, but you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the, to the, ends of the earth. That's even Ashland. That's us. That's our community. That's our neighborhood. 
So number f- the, the next point is five, is my story can bring God's glory. My story uh, about reversals, about good things, bad things, sideway things can be used for God's glory. You're thinking, well, yeah, that's easy. You grew up as a pastor's son. Yeah, well, I'm a little jaded towards church and things. And so I'm working through how's God going to use my experiences for his glory because I can relate to other people maybe that way. And God's, you've got a story that no one else can use and, and use for his kingdom because God's brought you through those areas. And let me encourage you that when you do that, be thinking through, hey, what, what has God used in my life that can make a difference in others? So your story can bring God's glory. You know, there's a few people that I think in the national media that I think would be good to take a look at. This is Truett Cathy. Uh, we don't have one in Ashland, but he's the founder of Chick-fil-A. You guys heard of this? There's one in Columbus, Cleveland, this one, Avon. Okay, Truett Cathy went to be with the Lord about a month ago, and he was the founder, like I said, of Chick-fil-A. And the way he did business, the way he used his platform for Jesus was amazing, about talking about Jesus, about using his platform, his influence, his, his circle was amazing. Even to be closed on Sunday was kind of outrageous because that's like the busiest day of the week for restaurants. So Truett Cathy was living his faith. His story has changed people's uh, history. His, I'm kidding. His story. Let's go to the next one. This is a favorite of mine. I almost wore the same suit. Tim Tebow. I know you're like, oh, the first hour wasn't real thrilled with him because I know he played somewhere south. Anyway, so here's a guy. I know John Gruden and the ESPN guys really don't like the way he throws the, vol- the ball, but don't we love the way he talks about Jesus and uses that platform? Just reading in the beginning of um, Sports Illustrated, Dan, uh, Dan Patrick was interviewing uh, a quarterback from Brigham Young. And Dan Patrick said, hey, do you, you're really, you know, you, you like going on missionary trips and talking about Jesus. Do you think of yourself as Tim Tebow? He goes, no, I don't think of myself like Tim Tebow in football, but I think of him like that spiritually. Isn't that amazing, the impact Tim Tebow's had? And now he's doing Good Morning America, so he's on, he's not even playing football. The next one, this one you, you're very familiar with, Dr. Kent Brantley was in the news with Ebola. And I, I've got a full text of his, a statement that he, read, that he wrote, sent out to the community, to the nation when he was released from Emory University Hospital. And I don't know if you got to see, there was a special on Matt Lauer uh, saving Dr. Brantley. And I think it's amazing that God used him to have Ebola, Ebola to, 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 to use that platform to talk about Jesus. Let me read just a quick excerpt on a statement he made that was read in the news clippings and around the world. I do, this is Dr. Kent Brantley speaking. I do not know then, but I have learned since that there were thousands, maybe even millions of people around the world praying for me throughout that week and even still today. I've heard the story after story how this situation has impacted the lives of individuals around the globe, both among friends, my family, and others, and and also among complete strangers, like the woman at the well. I cannot thank you enough for your prayers and your support, but what I can tell you is this. This is awesome. I serve a faithful God who answers prayer. Here's a guy that captured the moment and said, you know what, I'm gonna use this platform for God's glory. It's not all about me, it's about him. So your story can bring God's glory. And you know, the Bible talks about uh, being a witness. And um, a witness just says what, you know, what you've seen. When I said about, hey, I was once lost, but now I've been found. I, I was blind, but now I see. All you need to do is just be a witness for him. Um, you know, God didn't say, uh, hey, you're going to be my attorneys, right? Are you glad he didn't say you're going to be my attorneys? He's not asking you to prove anything. He's asking you to just tell your story. People aren't going to debate you about your story, about maybe... Um, you know, I can think maybe you're, you're going through a tough time financially or relationally or at home or at work or there's different things. I remember um, vividly uh, our youngest daughter, Adrian, needed to have open heart surgery, which is a really big deal. And we're down at Children's Hospital and I'm holding Adrian. We're, we're going around praying for all the other kids. They're going to go through surgeries that day. And I'll never forget just kind of those last moments before we say, say goodbye to her and knowing that this, man, this is going to turn out one of two ways. And you know what? This is for God's glory, whether this turns out the way we want or the way we really rather not. And I remember asking the doctors, just thinking we got to seize this moment. This is the only time I'm going to be in this, this hopefully, Lord willing, this area of life and, and season, and asking the doctors and the nurses to pray with us. And I'll never forget one of the nurses, when I said, hey, do you mind if we pray? She bursts out in tears. And I'm thinking, wow, this is really impactful. 
I should be the one crying or maybe Christina or my parents. And she said, you know what? It's been 21 years since anyone's asked to pray before a surgery that she's been involved in. I thought, man, God, thank you. Hopefully, let me get out of the way. Let me be a complete mirror for you because you know what? This is your child. Adrian's your, your, your daughter. I mean, I, she's just on loan us. We want to raise her and help her become a fully committed disciple, but God, she's yours. I mean, this, this is when life gets really hardball and not like, whoa, hey, hallelujah. No, this is, this is tough. So people aren't going to argue with your story. Here's the other good thing. Not only does God not call us to be your attorneys, he doesn't call us to be your salespeople. He's not asking you to sell anything. Just tell your story. In the Bible, it says, 2 Corinthians says, 2 Corinthians 5.18, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, so people, the Bible says that they're, they're enemies of God and with, you can be friends with Jesus. That's, that's phenomenal news. Two verses later, 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, or 5.20 says, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us, his appeal in our workplace, his appeal through us at our school, his appeal to us in the work. Um, in the neighborhood. We implore you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled by God. You can do that. We're ambassadors. Ambassadors are one that are sent, right? They're not, they're not talking on their own behalf. They're talking on behalf of the re- administration, the president, the group they're representing. An ambassador is someone who's sent, and we are his ambassadors. Your story, you using your story as an ambassador can use it for God's glory. And probably you're thinking, why am I on the job I'm at, or why am I at this? And again, he's put you there for a specific reason, to be salt and light. Maybe the, the doctors you're talking to, or um, the car dealership, anywhere you think about it. Where the circles that you're in, you can do this. Um, number seven is, I've been sent to represent. You have been sent, when you signed up, said, hey, I want to follow Jesus, you've been sent to represent. Um, I somehow skipped something. I'm sorry. I meant to say our history can change someone's destiny. The history of the woman at the well, she just changed the destiny of her entire town because they knew the life she had been living. And she left all her burden and her pain at the fate of Jesus and went back into town. I, mean, I just said that the, the disciples were just there. They didn't buy any of it. But they, they believed the story and of the committed the, the Christ that she, she now worships, which is phenomenal. So you've been sent to represent. But you know what? Loving people just isn't quite enough. I know it's I've heard people say, yeah, well, John, uh, preach the gospel, and if you need to, use words. Can I tell you, you got to use your words, okay? People aren't going to get saved when you say, God bless you, and they sneeze, right? Achoo, God bless you. Oh, hallelujah, I'm saved. No, you got to use your words throughout the day and throughout the week. Um, and I've got scripture to back it up when we say, walk the talk and talk the walk. Um, Romans 10, 14. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him whom they have not heard, right, with their ears? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? That's you. That's me. The way we, the way we talk. The walk, the walk, and we've got to talk the talk. It's got to match up. So there's someone at your work. Someone's got to tell them, okay? There's some individual, maybe in your family, that nobody wants to talk to, nobody wants to communicate with. Someone's, someone's got to tell them. Maybe that person that you just casually know. Maybe you just kind of summer in ash and then you're somewhere else uh, in the wintertime. There's someone waiting for you to just start the conversation about God. If we're going to be fully committed disciples, we've got to do that. It's open mic season at Ashland Grace, okay? Can I encourage you that? Whatever field you're in, whether you're at home or you volunteer at the library, whatever, it's your season to do this. It's our season. We have plenty of open seats. We could have more. And if anything, we want to direct people to Jesus, not to, not to just to ABFs or my small group, but, but to Jesus where we can find grace, we can find healing, we can find forgiveness, and we can be restored. You know, when people step up to the mic, they either, they're going to fumble, they're going to either, they're going to freeze, or they're going to fly. And many of us, we've all frozen, right? We get there and like, oh, I don't know what to say. Um, go in peace, you know, whatever. And then there's other times that we fumble like, hey, I've got the open pass. You know, if I'm out to lunch with the guys and say, hey, um, boy, you were just in the hospital. Tell us about who God, how God healed you. Oh, yeah, well, I see Dr. Dan. No, you need to be talking about what God did and you, through Dr. Dan. And so, and then also, so if you freeze, you fumble, and then you're on your way to flying. And I hope you can fly because if, if you've been fumbling, you're about to start flying. Just keep working at it. I've asked um, some guys to come up and join me on stage that we talked about some national people, and I'd like to look at some, 
some regular people that uh, are that are in our community. So I'm going to ask uh, Dwayne, Dave, and um, Kevin Smith to join me. I hope they stuck around and didn't go to the cafe because I think it closed at noon or 11. Good. Hey, I want to welcome them up. There's a friend of mine today, Dan Hazlitt, that wanted to be here, and um, he's out uh, working with Grace Brother and Boys. That's right. I'm going to sit over here. And um, he's. This is what's awesome. Here's a guy that's going out, being using his influence to help dads, men connect with their sons, to be kingdom men, to say, hey, this is the cross, this is where we're going. Here are some of the unique challenges of life. They're out camping, they're probably freezing their tails off right now, like, hallelujah, I'm inside. Um, and so I'm really proud of Dan Hazlitt wanted to join us as well. And so um, I've asked these guys, Dave, Dave Bartle, Barter, I'm sorry, I'm having a senior moment, Dave Barter, Kevin Smith, and Dwayne Fishpaw, I've asked them to join me just to talk about uh, the season and the, the influence that they have in their workforce, in, their, in the circles they're in, and um, just want to ask you just kind of an open mic type deal. So what's your attitude for us to think through lost people? What's your attitude towards lost people in your sphere of influence, in your workplace, when you see them? What's your attitude towards people that don't know Jesus, Dave? Okay, uh... Quite a few years ago, a guy invested a couple years of his time with me and changed my life. Um, and so my attitude, he, he gave me a great example of how I should look at others, uh, especially the losses. Everyone's worth, worth the investment. So um, that's, that's how I look at that. That's awesome. So we need to have an attitude that, that's worth investing in, right? That this is, you know what, and by the way, when, when you use your words, we talk about you've been sent to represent, you've been anointed and appointed. You need to use your words, and you know, God's word says it's not going to come back void, is it? So just step up to the mic. You can do it. So what are some simple things that you can offer us to be used by the Lord as, you know, bridge-building tools? What are some bridge-building tools that you can think of um, at our place of employment, in our schools, in our communities? What's, what's an easy way to bridge-build uh, build bridges with lost people, Kevin? I think one of the things that comes to mind to me is listening. Um, when I was teaching, um, you know, you could tell when students were having a bad day. And uh, just getting that student alone and just listening to where they're at um, gives you the opportunity to share. And, uh, you know, if, if we just go in and pounce on them and, and share Christ and give them all this stuff, they're, they're not really receptive to it. But if you first of all listen to them, and then you can share Christ, and they're uh, accepting of that. And we notice with the woman in the well, isn't it interesting that Jesus' kindness opened up her honesty? They didn't instantly judge her, but the, the kindness about, hey, I'm, I care about you. You know, when we looked at uh, the video earlier with the child with the A on his shirt about being authentic, we need to be authentic. People know when you're buffaloing them, right? So Dwayne Fishpaw, um, if you were a non-believer, how would you want some, someone to share Christ with you? I like the idea of uh, people telling me their story and how they became a believer. And, and because I think that, you know, they have a sphere of influence. And the, the lost souls also have a sphere of influence. And if you can, if somebody would come to me as a lost soul and tell me their story, then... My, I could share with the lost souls that I know in my sphere of influence, and it would, you know, go down, and it could spread out in a pyramid-type thing to where the little influence that they had on me, I could have on somebody else, and that little influence could, you know, take me toward the Lord, and I think that would be great. That's awesome. Way to have a kingdom conversation. So what do you gentlemen picture in your minds when you think about sharing your faith with someone? Is it, is it far? Is it near? Is it now or later? What do, what do you guys, give us some word images to think through when we're about to step up to the mic and we don't want to freeze. We don't want to fumble. We want to fly. We got like an elevator speech. We got 10 seconds with these people or just in passing or different season. What, give us some thoughts that maybe th that uh, stir you as you get ready to say, you know what, I'm going to step up. I'm going to talk about God. I'm going to have that conversation. I'm going to go there with this person. Is there anything in your minds that you, that spark you, Kevin? 
I think uh, it's a willingness on our part. Um, God's going to stir in our heart that we need to step out, we need to share. And for me, it's been comforting to know that I can't screw it up. No matter what I share, God's going to be able to use those words and, and uh, speak truth into their, their lives. Um, and I, I had a situation where I shared with an individual, and uh, we were from totally different worlds. Um, he was an alcoholic and into drugs, and, and, you know, I'm on the opposite extreme. I can't relate at all to that, but God placed on my heart to share with this guy. And uh, every time we met, I prayed, Lord, I, I have no idea what to share, but I know that you can speak through. And uh, again, going back to listening, I just sat and listened to him and then shared as gently as I could. And uh, uh, he's a believer today, not because of what I did, but only through what Christ does for each of us. Isn't that beautiful when we listen? Nobody's going to argue with our stories, are they? I mean, maybe, maybe people want to debate how, age was, how old was Goliath when he went down, I mean, some of that stuff. But they're not going to debate your story about where you've come from, right? They want to hear, is it authentic? Is it legit? How has God used you in your life? You know, I want to brag on a, a, a young mom that was here at our, our, our meal last week. This is perfect. Uh, so last week we had like a lasagna deal after church. We voted on some commissioners and different things. And there's a family, a mom with a young child that just showed up and said, hey, I knew there was a free meal, so I'm going to stay. And there was a, a family in our church, believers, great family, and just loved and just listened to the gal that was there and their hurts, their pain, and why maybe her husband doesn't feel comfortable coming to church and how, how am I going to be treated? But the awesome thing is she just listened and you know what, connected with her later this week, followed up with a text message, said, hey, how's it going? What can I do for you? How can I serve you? That, isn't that the kind of relationship we just want to start with people, not hit them over the head with Ezekiel, but just, just loving people? I mean, what, what does love require of us? What does the Bible, God's word say, love require of us? So Mother Teresa says, do small things with great love. What are some practical examples of some small things that you, that we, we can do to invest in non-believers? I think, uh, like he said, listening is huge. Uh, just extra kindness, uh, showing that you care, and uh, the the biggest thing that I found is just taking time. Uh, you know, you can give them a lot of stuff, but giving them your time is, I think, where you really get, you know, see lives changed. And we probably need to put the phone down. It's not like you and me talking and like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, oh really? Oh my goodness. Right, we, we gotta connect with people on the, on the, the right level. That's good. Um, hey, are business relationships sometimes hard to, inter to introduce Jesus or talk about eternal things in business and work? Are those, can those be challenging? Get to look for the right moments? Dwayne? I think in business relationships sometimes it's hard, but you know, I was on the fire department for 31 years, and I think you always get the opportunity. Maybe it's a squad call or or something where you know somebody isn't going to make it on a on a run you're on, and you you know you try to at least you know ask them. You know, do you want to pray? Do you you know uh, you know you try to do things for people and just little things, and in your situations with the people that you work with, you show them how, you're, how you live your life. And I think even for the non-believers that you work with, you know, they look, they look at you as an example. And even just the fact that you're with them all the time at a place, you know, and I think that it can rub off. And I think that's what we're all trying to do is, is that love of Jesus that's in us is overflowing and let it overflow to these people around you just by the way you live. That's good, and the Holy Spirit will give us strength. What I love about even that fire, being a fireman, you're not, you're not showing up and say, hey, you guys are gonna be burning in hell, right? Hotter and longer because of your sin. You know, that you're gonna be in the boiler room. No, you're trying to give them hope and peace and not hitting them over. You get the idea? Because some of us maybe need to back it off a little bit and not be so judgmental, but just... Love people, listen to them. It's going to take time. It's sometimes to be very inconvenient. Like, really, now? You got to tell me about that? 
But you know, the great thing about Jesus is he wasn't even worried about the schedule and where he's got to go because he, he came for what? Our sins, he's going to the cross or everything else. How, how is he making disciples? That's good. Um, let me ask you this. And um, So if Christ is both creator and savior of the world, then why might I fear sharing him with those who appear to be so different? If we believe that Jesus is the creator and savior of the world, why is it sometimes we have such a fear in sharing with people that are different? Like we just talked about the woman at the well, the woman of Samaria. Why is it that we get nervous or we just shut down or we back off going, yeah, I don't think so. They maybe look different than us. Why is it, guys, do you think we do that, have the natural tendency to do that? I did this recently while you're thinking about it. I was at a restaurant, a uh, gal was serving ice cream uh, in Mansfield, and I just, said, I just said, hey, tell me about, you got, a, you got a date on your arm with some fresh ink. She goes, yeah, that's when uh, my dad died. I'm like, wow, I'm sorry to hear that. How old were you? Because she looked like that was about the time she was born. She goes, yeah, that was about five weeks after I was born, my dad died. I said, man, I'm sorry to hear that. How you doing now? I mean, these are open-ended questions. Well, I've got a new dad, and he's not whatever. You're just, you're just listening to people. I mean, it's amazing what they'll just tell you. You just, you just ask, and they'll show up. So is there anything um, that, you, that you like to say or think about when talking to people that are not like you? Let's say you're not running to a fire. You're not running to do schoolwork or whatever. I mean, Dave, when you and I are at Hillsdale doing FCA, we're a few years older than those middle school students, right? So what do, are there some ways that you share besides your story to help our middle school kids connect with Christ or, 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 or Kevin? Uh, I, I think uh, just a lot of times it's not comfortable, um, especially when you're around people that aren't like you, whether they're younger, um, you know, older or different. Uh, and I think just giving them your time and uh, thinking you know, the eternal implications of the whole situation really help you get past your uh, uh, personal insecurities, you know, I'm going to say something wrong. Uh, do I look dumb? Do they think I'm dumb? Are they going to get mad at me? Uh, whatever it is, uh, you know, y you have a, sm you know, you can play a part, you know, in, in their eternity. That's right. Let me leave you with three last things on your thoughts. Thank you, gentlemen. Stay right there. On the bottom part of your our page, I put just some quick uh, quick notes as we, as, we, as we close. First one is don't give a speech. No, nobody Nobody likes speeches, right? I mean, I, there's been times I've been trying to be witnessing to people and I'm quoting most of the Bible that I know and I'm not even breathing. I've got gills in the back of my neck and the people are passed out. They stopped listening like 10 minutes ago, okay? Speeches don't work. Don't give a speech. You know what? Um, just, just like you said, listen to them. Hear their story. Get off talking about you. Listen to them. Second of all, give it in small doses. Read their body language. If they're passed out, they're probably not interested, right? But if they're engaged, you keep going and just give them maybe something that's on your heart or what God's been teaching you or just something that's going to move, move the spiritual dial of them considering a walk with Jesus. You'll, believe me, you'll know when you've said enough, okay? And also the last one is be bold. Step out. Like we've said, you've been sent to represent. God's, God's hand, if you know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, his hand's on your life, whether you're sharing faith in the prisons, to the pastors, to wherever, his hand's on your life. And not only that, but you've been anointed and appointed. You need to go where no one else can go. Hey, you guys have been wonderful. Thanks so much for spending your Sunday morning with us. How about I close in prayer and we'll be dismissed, okay? Dear Lord, thank you so much for these men and the men and women in our audience that represent you. I just ask that you would give us a new conviction, new eyes, new vision, new transparency to be reaching families and people for you. That's why you came to earth was to save us from our sins. We're so grateful you did. Help us to be salt and light in all of our areas from the PTA to the schoolroom to the boardroom to wherever that uh, Ash and Grace people would step up to the mic and, and fly with, with words that are from you. So we're committed to you, Lord. Keep us, we want to keep you at the focal point of our lives. In Christ's name, amen. Hey, thank you. Have a great Sunday.